call to worship this morning from Matthew 28, 5 and 6. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus, who is crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Church, let us stand together and worship our risen King this morning. Amen. He 
it's risen so good to be with you guys this Easter Sunday to celebrate the resurrection of our Savior, our Lord, and the one we treasure most in this life. It's so good to hear your voices. It's so good to exclaim that we believe in this truth, that Jesus truly is the Messiah and the King. Amen? Amen. Let me officially welcome you to the church at Spring Hill. If we haven't met, my name is Jess Rayner. I serve as lead pastor here. I hope you feel welcomed. I hope you uh, feel just welcomed into our church family. We believe this is a place that we love each other's brothers and sisters in Christ, and we hope you feel that love this morning. I want to encourage you at some point during our worship service to fill out our connect card. We ask every person every week to do it, whether it's your first time, 100 time, or more than that. Uh, you'll find this in the seat back pocket in front of you. Fill this out. Uh, if you're more uh, tech savvy, you want to fill out our digital connect card, scan that little QR code with your phone, um, and you can fill out our connect card that way. For every card turned in, we donate money back to our community. We actually donate $5 for every connect card turned in. And it's our way to share the hope of Jesus with other organizations that are like-minded. And so do that at some point in the service. Let us know you're here. Let us know how we can be praying for you uh, and participate in our vision that we exist because everyone needs the hope of Jesus this morning. And as a reminder, uh, you do drop those in the two boxes in the back. If you brought any financial gifts with you today on your way out, you can also drop those in the boxes in the back. I want to read from John 20. It's the scene where, where Jesus appears to Thomas. Eight days later, the disciples were together again. This time, Thomas was with them. The doors were locked, but suddenly, as before, Jesus was standing among them. Peace be with you, he said. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here. Look at my hands. Put your hand into the wound in my side. Don't be faithless any longer. Believe. Believe. You know what Thomas said after that? My Lord and my God, Thomas exclaimed. It didn't say he whispered it. It didn't say he said it, it said he exclaimed it, my Lord and my God. In that moment, he knew that Jesus truly had risen from the dead and he was the King of Kings. And the only response that he could have is to say, my Lord and my God, it's you. Church family, this Easter Sunday, I want you to come ready right now in this moment to exclaim it. We're not gonna whisper it, we're not gonna say it, we're gonna exclaim it, my Lord and my God. We're going to stand with each other and say, this is my God. Look at what he's done. Look what he did for me. My Lord and my God. I'm going to pray. You ready your hearts. And we're going to exclaim it with everything we have, that this is our God. God, we come to you now. Your sons and daughters. We're here to worship you. We're here to exclaim that you are our Lord. You are our God. We're here to tell the world that this is our God, the one who saved us, gave us hope, and freed us from, the, from an eternity apart from you. God, I pray right now that every heart is filled, ready to sing, and ready to exclaim, this is my God. We love you. It's your son's name we pray. Amen. This is 
is our God, this is what he does, he saves us. He bore the cross, beat the grave, in heaven and earth proclaim, this is our God, King Jesus. Remember that fear that took our breath away. So weak that we could barely pray We heard every word, every whisper And now those altars in the wilderness Tell the story of His faithfulness Never once did He fail at any day Sweet, he loves us. This is our God. This is what he does. He saves us. He pulled the cross, beat the grave. Let heaven and earth proclaim. This is our God, King Jesus. Who pulled me out? Who pulled me out of our pit? He did. He did. Who paid for all of our sin? Nobody but Jesus. Come on, church. Who rescued me from that grave? He did. He did. Who paid for all of our sin? Nobody but Jesus. Who rescued me from that grave? Yahweh. Yahweh. Who gets the glory and praise? Nobody but Jesus. Who rescued me from that grave? Yahweh, Yahweh, who gets the glory and praise? Nobody but Him. This is our God. This is who He is. He loves us. This is our God. This is what He does. He saves us. Pull the cross, beat the grave. May heaven and earth proclaim. Pull the cross, beat the grave, let the men on earth proclaim this is our God, King Jesus. He's worthy, church. He's worthy of all our praise. Sing this out with me. Who rescued me from that grave? Yahweh, Yahweh. Who gets the glory and praise? Nobody but Jesus. Who rescued me from that grave? Yahweh, Yahweh. Who gets the glory and praise? Nobody but Jesus. Thank you. 
just taking in those words, realizing that there's no enemy that can hold you, hold you down, that the, the, the crown is rightfully placed on your head because you defeated sin in the grave. We're, if we've been in the faith all our lives or, or seemingly most of our lives, God, let that not just be something that we just, we skip over today and, and check the box and say, yeah, we did Easter. But God, let, let us be reminded, especially today, and, and to take that message of the resurrection and, and just be wowed by it, be, be transformed by it every day. But for anyone in, in this place that's, that's coming like a doubting Thomas or coming like a, a person that just has all these reasons why I can't give you control of my life. I don't really know if it's real. God, let today be the, the place and the point where they say, he lives. I can't deny it. I can't run from it. Lord, we just thank you and we praise you. Have all have your way here, Lord. Let this just be something glorious that we that we are pointed to when someday we are singing holy, holy, holy. Just endless praise around that throne. amazing how things come full circle. As a parent, I, I find myself saying a lot of the phrases that, that I heard as a kid. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to test you guys to see how well you know some of these phrasing. It, 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 you try and finish these. If, if you can't say anything nice, then love it. You get what you get and you don't throw a... Uh, the first service, I got a big amen out of that one. I don't know. There's a parent that was walking through something with that right now. With Sharing is... All right. Uh, how about this one? You can pick your friends and you can pick your nose, but you can't pick your friends's. By the way, I disagree with this one as a parent, all right? I, uh, I tell my kids, just let me pick your friends and the nose picking is completely up to you, all right? No, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. That, that doesn't fly in our house, all right? There's one, there's one particular uh, phrase that I heard as a kid that was absolutely transformational for me. Every time I would go to my dad and, 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 and I would bring him some of those biggest questions in life, some of the things I was absolutely wrestling with, just bearing my soul to him, and he would look at me with just this sincere look and he said, Jess, go ask your mother, right? <laughs> and I'm glad he did because I don't know where I'd be if he actually gave me advice. So I'm super thankful, right? And, and now I say the same things, go ask your mom. I love it, it's just wonderful, it's, it's so great. There's one more though, all right? There's one more that I've, I found myself saying as a parent. And typically it goes like this. I'll have a kid who goes and, and is looking for his or her shoe. They'll find the right one, but they can't find the left one. And they'll come running to me and say, Dad, I can't find my shoe. I said, well, did you look in the shoe bin that has like 8,000 shoes in it? Yes, I looked, okay? It's not there. And what do I tell that kid? Go look again. And they run to the basket and it's there, right? It happens to me. I'll open the fridge. I don't know if your fridge has this problem, but my fridge has this problem. I'll open up and I'm looking for the ketchup bottle. And I'm looking and I'm looking everywhere. And I can't find, I'll go, Rachel, where's the ketchup bottle? You know what she says? 
Look again. And then magically it appears. I don't know. Like something's wrong with my fridge. It magically appears. It's there. But that phrase, those, those two words, look again, they're powerful. Why? Because the person that's saying them has the confidence that you will find what you are looking for. Today, we come and we walk up to the empty tomb. And we're going to wrestle with the reality, the truth, that Jesus is truly alive. And what I'm asking for some of you to do today is to simply look again. Because I have the confidence for those of you who don't know Jesus as your Savior and Lord, that you will find the truth, that he is Messiah, he is King. Here's simply what I want you to get at, what I want you to walk away with today, it's this, Jesus wants you to look again into the tomb. Go ahead and open up your Bibles to John chapter 20. And I'm hoping that, especially some of you who may have grown up in church, that maybe today is the day that you look again. We're going to be in John chapter 20. We're going to cover most of the book, but I just want to read the first 10 verses to get started. And as a reminder, this is God's word. His living, breathing, active word that speaks. So let's all ready ourselves and let's listen. John 20. Early on Sunday morning, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. She ran and found Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. She said, they have taken the Lord's body out of the tomb and we don't know where they have put him. Peter and the other disciple started out for the tomb. They were both running, but the other disciple ran Peter and reached the tomb first. He stooped and looked in. He saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he didn't go in. Then Simon Peter arrived and went inside. He noticed the linen wrappings lying there while the cloth that had covered Jesus' head was folded up and lying apart from the other wrappings. Then the disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in and saw and believed. For until then, they still hadn't understood the scriptures that said Jesus must rise from the dead. Then they went home. You all pray with me. God, we ask that you bless the reading of your word. It's, it's what we come hungry for. God, in a world that's throwing all these different truths out there, we come hungry for the truth, your truth. May it speak, and God, I ask you just to make me nothing but a pure channel of your grace. Make me nothing but a mouthpiece. That everything is said, it's, it's of you and for you. God, give us all ears to hear. Let us listen to your word and your word alone. God, we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, as we start by looking at these first 10 verses, we look at Peter and, and John and their encounter with the empty tomb. I, I want to start simply with, simply but with, with magnitude, a, a, a truth, a foundational statement. And it's simply this, Jesus truly rose from the dead. We say it in church a lot, but I want it, I want it to take on a deeper hold in our hearts I want us to see what it means that Jesus truly rose from the dead. This is monumental to the Christian faith, right? I don't know if you ever played the, the Jenga game, right? There's always that one piece you don't want to take out because you know the tower is going to fall. The resurrection is that for the Christian faith. If this piece is out, the rest of the Christian faith is meaningless. Paul, writing to the church of Corinth, said this, if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is useless and you are still guilty of your sins. In that case, all who've died believing in Christ are lost. And if our hope in Christ is only for this life, we are more to be pitied than anyone in the world. The resurrection of Jesus is absolutely foundational to the Christian faith. And so we have to start by looking at John, looking at Peter, how they looked again the tomb to see that Jesus truly rose from the dead. So let's pick up the scene back in verse 1. We see it's early morning. Mary runs to the tomb. The stones roll away. Verse 2, she runs back. And she's saying, hey, Simon Peter and the other disciple, this is John, right, the one whom Jesus loved. Peter and John, 
It goes back, we don't know where the body is, we don't know where the body is. In verse three, we see Peter and John start running for the tomb. And then verse four, it says they were both running, but the other disciple outran Peter. By the way, I love, I love verses like this because it reminds us of the, the humanity and the personality of, of the people who write it, right? John's writing, and he just happens to make a note that he won the race to the tomb first, right? It's like he looked at Peter, you can, you can walk on water, but you're slow on land. Like, come on. And he just makes the note, right? I love it. It just shows us just how, how good the Bible is. What happened when they got to the tomb? Verse 5, he stooped. John, the, the, the disciple whom Jesus loved, stooped and looked in, but he didn't go in. Then Simon Peter arrived, and he's just, you know, he's full on sprint, right? He has no finish line with him. He went right inside. He also noticed the linen wrappings. While the cloth that covered Jesus' head was folded up and lying apart from the other wrappings. When Peter and John arrived at the tomb, the tomb was empty. If you were, if you were to study history and you were to read the scholars and you read the historians, they largely agree on, on the fact that there was a man named Jesus. He actually lived. He was killed. He was buried. And three days later, his tomb was empty. There's very little debate about that. Historically, that, there's very little debate. Where the debate comes in is how did the tomb get empty? And over the centuries, there's been lots of different viewpoints on it. I'm going to give you three, very quickly, of how some people say the tomb became empty, two of which I believe are not very logical. The first one's this. Some believe that Jesus actually didn't die. And let me just put this one to rest really fast. The Romans were excellent in their craft. They knew how to crucify. They knew how to execute people. I, I, just call it what it is. Like They were professionals at this. There is no way that they would have failed at their job, especially with Jesus. So the idea they didn't really die, and there's a lot of other things you can say about it, it really doesn't have much weight to it all. The second thing that people say, why, why was the tomb empty, or how did it get empty? Well, a lot of people believe that the body of Jesus was stolen. Well, who stole it? Well, some people say the Jews, right? And this one can be easily debunked, because the Jews were out to prove that Jesus was wrong. All the Jews had to do was show the body, right? And everything's fallen away, but they never did. Well, some people say, well, it's the disciples who stole the body. Let's think about this for a moment. What happened to the disciples? Did they just like ride off on a cruise sunset, you know, just laying back on the catamaran, enjoying life? No. They went through horrific, most of them, horrific deaths. If they stole the body, do you really think 12 disciples for 40 years could keep the hoax alive? One of my favorite quotes by this is a man by the name of Charles Colson, and he talks about the, the Watergate scandal, if you remember that, that whole story, the Watergate scandal, and he compares that and the testimony of, of those involved with the Watergate with the testimony of the disciples, and, and here, here's what he says. I know the resurrection is a fact, and Watergate proved it to me. How? Because 12 men testified that they had seen Jesus raised from the dead, and they proclaimed that truth for 40 years, never once denying it. Everyone was beaten, tortured, stoned, and put in prison. They would have not endured it if it was not true. Watergate embroiled 12 of the most powerful men in the world, and they couldn't keep alive for three weeks. You're telling me 12 apostles could keep alive for 40 years? Absolutely impossible. There's no reason, right, these 12 men would have gone to their deaths over a hoax. Not on top of that, like, if you're actually to, to see this scene when, when, Jane, uh, when John and Peter come to the tomb, what did they find in the tomb? The linens. Right? If you were to remove a body, the thing you would not do is take away the linens. The linens were there to preserve the body. All right? And you take it away, you're going to be dealing with the smell that, that you don't want. Right? It didn't make any sense why the linens were there. But not only were the linens there, how were they there? They were folded. All right? If you're breaking into someone's house trying to steal some things, would you take the time to make their bed? Like, No. Right? It doesn't make any sense why someone committing a crime would sit there, take the linens off, and then take the time to fold them. Right? All the evidence is that 
Jesus truly rose. No one stole the body. Jesus truly died, which leads us to our third and most logical reason of why the tomb was empty, which is what? Jesus truly rose from the dead. Literally and physically, Jesus came alive again. Today, some of you need to take hold of that foundational truth. You need to go look at the tomb again. When John first arrived, what did he do in verse 5? What does it say he did? He looked, but he didn't go in. Then what happened in verse 8? The disciple who reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw, and he believed. This is the second look. It was that, uh, could this be? And then he goes in and says, it is. Some of you have gone and you spent your whole life in church and you've kept an arm's distance from the tomb. And you've just kind of been peeking around. Easter Sunday, it's amazing. What God is calling you to do today is to run in like Peter. To be like John and take a second look and step in and see the truth that Jesus really rose from the dead. Because that truth changes everything about your life. How you answer that question sets yourself on one path or the other. Because everything in the Christian faith is holding on to this truth. You need this foundational truth in your life that Jesus truly rose. Sometimes we need a second look in order to believe. Today's that day for some of you. And I get it. You may be coming here today. You have questions. You have doubts. You're trying to figure out how to explain all these pieces. Well, Jesus knew that. Jesus knew you'd wrestle. Jesus knew one of his disciples would wrestle, specifically Thomas. And so we, we fast forward a little bit in John chapter 20, and here's what we see next in these verses. You can trust that the resurrection of Jesus is true. See, God has provided more than enough evidence to make the resurrection historically verifiable. But that doesn't necessarily mean that you can explain everything that happened with the resurrection. There's just some questions we can't answer. And so Jesus addresses this with his own disciple, Thomas. Turn to John 20, verse 24. Just skip down a little bit. And by the way, if, if you're just a glance at the verses right before this, uh, Jesus had already appeared to the other disciples. Thomas wasn't there. We don't know why. Maybe he was on a pizza run. Most likely he was putting pineapple on his pizza, which is the only way to do it. We don't know. But eventually, right, he came back. And, and, and look at this scene that starts in verse 24. One of the 12 disciples, Thomas, was not with them when Jesus came. This is the first time. They told him, Thomas, we, we have seen the Lord. But Thomas replied, I won't believe it until I see the nail wounds in his hand, put my fingers in them, and place my hand into the wound in his side. Like Thomas from this passage gets, I think, a pretty unfair moniker named Doubting Thomas, right? Lots of people doubted in Scripture. In fact, if you were to just to even go and read about the ascension of Jesus in just a few more chapters, there are people that watched Jesus go into heaven and they still doubted, okay? So unfair. But for some reason, God decided to put Thomas's doubt in the Bible for all humanity, for all time to read. I don't know, it, but it is, right? What, what happened with Thomas's doubt? What did Jesus do? And we read this at the beginning of the service, verse 26. Eight days later, when the disciples were together again, this time Thomas was with them. The doors were locked, but suddenly, as before, Jesus was standing among them. Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here. Look at my hands. Put your hand in the wound in my side. Don't be faithless any longer. Believe. And what did Thomas do? He exclaimed, my Lord and my God. Did, did Jesus go up to Thomas and reprimand him for having doubts, for having questions? No. Did Jesus sit down with Thomas and go, okay, let me explain everything to you. I want to give you a play-by-play -play play of everything that happened. Here's what it's going to take. And now because of that, you did Jesus do that? No. What did Jesus do? Look at my wounds. Look at my hands. Touch, touch the side. Thomas, look at me. I am alive. Jesus was showing Thomas that he really died and that he was really alive. Jesus was taking what was unexplainable and making it undeniable.
Thomas couldn't explain the resurrection, but in that moment, he couldn't deny the resurrection. Some of you need to ask yourselves this morning as you look into the tomb, what am I going to do when the unexplainable meets the undeniable? One of my favorite stories talking about what's unexplainable and what's undeniable actually comes from a physicist. Uh, I think it was a, a Yale physicist. His name was Robert Adair. And about 20 plus years ago, he studied, all right, and some of you baseball people, you're going to love this. He studied how fast it takes a, a, a pitcher to pitch a 90 mile an hour fastball from the moment it leaves his hand to the moment it hits the catcher's glove. And, and he timed it, and basically he says it takes about 400 milliseconds to go, uh, what's that, 90, uh, 60 feet, 6 inches, right? It takes about 400 milliseconds. Okay, about less than half a second. That's fast. Well, he went on to say, what does it take for a batter to hit a 90 mile an hour fastball? And he, he did some, some quick calculations. And I know you're like, Jess, it's Easter. We can't do math. Just walk with me for a second, all right? This physicist says it takes the brain about 200 milliseconds to find the ball in the air, get the image, and decide if he wants to swing or not. All right, so 200 milliseconds just figuring out what's going on. Then... If the batter decides to swing, it takes the brain another 100 milliseconds to actually make the decision. All right, so 200 milliseconds, finding the ball, deciding what to do, 100 milliseconds to make a decision. And then finally, it takes 150 seconds to actually swing the bat. Okay? So 200 seconds, figuring out what's going on, 100 seconds, making a decision, and 150 seconds to actually swing the bat. Anybody do quick math with me? How many seconds was that? 450 milliseconds, right? How long did the physicist say it takes from the ball to, to go from the hand of the pitcher to the glove? 400 milliseconds. What this physicist said is it's based on science. It's absolutely impossible for a batter to hit a 90 mile an hour fastball. The facts are there. You need 450 seconds, but you only have 400 seconds. So are we all gonna be in agreement today that it's impossible for an MLB batter to hit a 90 mile an hour fastball? <laughs> no. Why? Because you've seen it, right? You've seen the evidence. You've seen your favorite batter stand against a pitcher and knock one out of the park. You've seen it with a 95 mile an hour fastball. You've probably seen it with a 98 mile an hour fastball. So you have to ask yourself, the science says it's unexplainable, but you're saying you've seen it and it's undeniable. What are you going to do? You know you're going to take what's undeniable over the unexplainable. Some of you have walked into this place and you're like, I just, I don't know. Like, you're right. You may not have all the answers, but it doesn't, wait, doesn't take away the truth that Jesus really rose from the dead. What you're going to have to do is figure out what are you going to do with that? Because I'm going to tell you it's undeniable. It's historically verifiable, but it's absolutely undeniable that Jesus truly rose from the dead. Thomas saw it, and all it took, like he didn't have to touch, he just had to see. And he said, my Lord and my God. For some of you, what you need to do this Easter is to doubt your doubts. What if you're wrong? You may be thinking, well, Jess, if Jesus appeared to me like Thomas, then I would believe too. If that's what you're thinking, I want to tell you this. That shows that your doubts are not your problem. Because you'd be willing to let go of your doubts if you just had a little bit more evidence. The doubts aren't the problem. The problem is you're choosing not to see Jesus for who he said he is. God is pursuing you this moment, and you know it, but you're not willing to lay down your doubts because you know what will happen if you do lay down your doubts. You're going to be forced to pick the undeniable over the unexplainable. You're going to be forced to surrender your life because you're going to realize that Jesus truly rose from the dead. See, the problem isn't your doubts. The problem is that you want to control your life. And controlling your life works until it doesn't. I've been there. Controlling your life works until it doesn't. And the problem is, if you reach that moment in life and you don't have Jesus, it's going to be a lot harder. But if you have Jesus, 
you have hope. For some of you, it's time to doubt your doubts and look at the tomb again. And some of you are struggling, like, I, that means I have to give up control. Well, here's the beautiful thing. Jesus shows us exactly what that looks like. We see one more person this morning. And Mary is going to quickly discover that she can't save herself. She realizes she needs something more to believe. The last thing we see this morning is you can believe in the resurrection only because of Jesus. The only way you can believe in the resurrection is because of Jesus. We go to verse 11. We see the scene. Where Mary was standing outside the tomb. And as she wept, she stood and looked in. She saw two white-robed angels, one sitting at the head, the other at the foot of the place where the body of Jesus had been laying. Dear woman, why are you crying? The angels asked her. Wouldn't, wouldn't that be enough right there for you guys? It's like the angels are like, why are you crying? And she says, because they have taken away my Lord. I don't know where they put them. See, here's the beautiful thing. Every time Jesus meets someone, he gives them what they need. He helps them believe. And just think about Mary. This isn't the mother of Jesus. This is Mary Magdalene. Think about all that she saw. Like, she walked with Jesus. She followed Jesus. She saw his miracles. She, she saw him, you know, raise someone from the dead. She, she heard him, right, declare that he will die and that he will rise three days later. She saw him deliver on promise after promise after promise. But what was her response? It was unbelief. She's crying because the body is gone. She's crying because the tomb is empty. Never once did it cross her mind, just maybe it's true. Her response should have been rejoicing. The tomb is empty, but yet she's grieving. So what was Mary's problem? We come to find out in this moment, in just a moment, we're going to read these verses. Mary was choosing to control her own life. She's about to see that Jesus is going to give her something that she needs in order to believe. Faith has to come from the outside. We don't have enough inside of us to spiritually raise us from the dead. Dead men can't raise themselves from the dead. And Mary's about to learn it's going to take something from the outside to change her life. And John 6, tells us, For no one comes to the Father no one comes to me unless the Father who sent me draws them to me. We hold on to our unbelief because that means we have to let something or someone outside of us take control. Tim Keller said it this way. The human heart is this way. It will deny and resist even what it most wants. If it discovers that, in order to get it, it has to lose control to someone else. There's a primordial desire that the heart has to change, has to stay in charge. What did Jesus do for Mary in this moment? Look at verse 14. She turned to leave and saw someone standing there. It was Jesus, but she didn't recognize him. Dear woman, why are you crying, Jesus said. What are you looking for? She thought that he was a gardener. Like of all the things to think Jesus was, it was a gardener, right? Sir, if you've taken him, please, please just tell me where he is. Like why would the gardener take the body? It doesn't make any, just, this is how desperate, just give me his body. I just want his body. I know he's dead, but I just want his body, please. I want to make sure he's buried properly. I want to do all the rites. I want to do all the things. I just, I want to grieve the right way. Just give me his dead body back. What does verse 16 say? Mary. Mary. You know what she did? She looked again. And what did she say? Abuni, teacher, it's you. You're here. And she goes and she just grabs a hold of him. She embraces him. 
In that moment, Mary in her unbelief, she was maintaining control. I'm just going to do it this way. We got to finish it. We got to do the job. We got to do it. Not realizing that maybe, just maybe, Jesus was who he said he was. And he did what he said he would do. Just maybe in that moment, she never believed until he showed himself. And he gave her what she needed to believe. Some of you have been walking the Christian life trying to do the things that you needed to do to earn your way into his presence. It can't happen that way. The only way for you to come into a saving relationship with Jesus Christ is by you saying, Jesus, teacher, Messiah, I see you. In 1883, there's a man by the name of George Wilson. And he committed a crime that caused him to be sentenced to death. He was scheduled to be hung. Well, for some unknown reason, President Andrew Jackson gave George Wilson a full pardon. When the warden received the pardon, he walked to George Wilson and he says, you're no longer guilty. You're free. You know what George Wilson did? He said, no. I don't want it. In fact, he took it back to the courts to legally take away his pardon. Well, eventually he made it all the the way up to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court made a ruling, and this is their ruling. A pardon is an act of grace, which exempts the individual on whom it is bestowed from the punishment the law inflicts for a crime he has committed. A pardon is a deed to the validity of which delivery is essential. A delivery is not complete without acceptance. It may then be rejected, and if it be rejected, we have discovered no power in a court to force it on him. George Wilson died with a pardon sitting on the warden's desk. Life was right in front of him. All he had to do was accept it. Today, this very day, Jesus is offering you all life, eternal life. He really lived the perfect sinless life. He really died on the cross so that you didn't have to. Every one of us, because of our sins, deserves to be on that cross. We deserve the wrath of God, but Jesus said, I'm stepping in. And Jesus took away the penalty that we deserve. He died, was buried, and he truly rose from the grave, conquering sin and death for all eternity. To begin a personal relationship with Jesus, all you have to do is simply repent of your sins, profess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, make him your Messiah, and he will give you free life. Life eternal. Question is, are you going to look again? Are you going to accept this free gift of salvation? If you're here today, please don't leave this room without coming and finding me with one of the elders. Please, if you need Jesus in your life, I'll stay here all day if I have to. I'll talk to as many as you have to because it's the most important decision you can make in your life. It's truly believing that Jesus rose again. Because it changes everything. I'll close with one final question for you today. Why was that stone rolled away? When Mary came to the grave, it says the stone was rolled away. Why? Did Jesus need the stone to be moved in order to get out? 
No, I mean, we know he, he made his way through locked doors. So it was very clear. Why did the stone need to be rolled away? It wasn't so that Jesus could get out. It was so that you can look in. It's so that you can stop on the outside and you can, you can look in and see there's no body. It's so that you can see the linens that are there and they're folded and they're neatly. And you can take a step back and be, can this really be true? And then it's for you to step in. And to see that Jesus truly is the Messiah and the King. There's one thing you do this Easter, it's look again. For those of you that have Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, worship and rejoice. For those of you who don't, don't leave here today without looking again and beginning a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. God, I pray that you begin to stir hearts. God, I pray that you, <laughs> pray for the person right now that, that is wrestling with the unexplainable and the undeniable. God, you're, you're prodding on their heart, you're poking at their heart, and, and, and they're just, they're right there. God, I pray that you give them what they need to open their eyes and, and to let them spiritually see you. God, I pray it is, it's a moment that's undeniable for them, that they have been trying to control their lives and they're realizing that, that they, they can't control anymore. They don't know what tomorrow brings and they're finally saying, I'd rather put my faith and trust of the creator of the world, the savior of the world, than my own self. And they say yes to you. God, give them the courage to come find me after the service, during the service. Give them the courage, God. Let their eternities be changed today. And God, we're going to give you all the glory for it. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Well, church family, one of the amazing things about someone professing Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord is that we get to celebrate that as a church family. And God has given us a, a really cool way of, of doing this. And he gave us uh, this thing called baptism. It's a way of, of letting Christ followers publicly tell the world, publicly telling their church family that they have made a decision in their hearts to believe in Jesus Christ. And it's so cool, we, we have our baptism set up. And, and, and this is nothing but a symbol. I've had the chance to talk with, with some of our, our, our kids who are going to be baptized here in just a minute. And, and I explained to them what it, what it means, right? And I often use the analogy of my wedding ring. I talk about, I, I made a decision some 16 years ago to marry my wife. And I, that relationship before God was covenant together and nothing can change that. But I decided on that day to put a wedding ring on so I can let the world know that I'm married. If I take it off, it doesn't change anything. But I put it on because I wouldn't let the world know. Baptism's like that. It doesn't change their status before God. They're just coming before their church family to say, I believe that Jesus Christ, and they're publicly professing it in front of you today. And the, the baptism is a symbol of a tomb. Just as Jesus went down into the tomb, So do we die, but our old life dies, and we're raised in new life, just as Jesus rose from the dead. And so we had this cool opportunity, church family, to celebrate new life in Christ with four, four of our kids. And while each baptism is special, I'm going to start with one that's personal. Collins, come on up here. <laughs> this one belongs to me. This is my youngest, Collins Joy. 
And Collins, we've been, we've been talking a while about you getting baptized, right? It's been about a year that you've been saying, Dad, I think it's time for me to get baptized. Dad, I think it's time to get baptized. I kept saying, let's just talk about it a little bit more. And then you came up to me about a month ago and said, Dad, it's Easter. I want to get baptized, right? And I said, it's no denying it now. I know the decision you've made in your heart. I see it in your life. I see the joy. I see the fruit. And it makes me so happy to know that one day me and you are going to be standing in front of Jesus worshiping. And I'm so proud of you for coming before your church family to let everyone know that you have Jesus in your heart. So church family, we took a moment and we recorded her testimony. I want you guys to hear from her exactly what Collins believes. Amen. Collins, do you believe that Jesus Christ lived a perfect sinless life, died on the cross, conquered sin and death, and rose again three days later? Have you made Jesus Christ your Savior, your Lord, and your treasure? Based upon your profession of faith and obedience to the command of Scripture, I now baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. Buried with Christ in death, raised to walk in your life. keep going here. Um, I'm super excited. I'm going to ask Brandon uh, go ahead and join me up here. Go ahead and bring up your kids, Charlie, Presley, Ruby. Um, one of the, the treats I have as a pastor is, is to be able to walk alongside other families who are discipling their kids, who are sharing Christ with their kids. And Brandon and Bonnie have been doing that uh, with their kids. Uh, it's the evidence you can see just if you get to know them, how much each one of these three love Jesus. And so it's so cool when a family comes together and although they have at different times accepted Jesus, um, this is the time. that. that you all felt as parents that they're ready to publicly profess their faith in front of their church family. So I'm super excited. I'm super thankful um, that you have led your children in this way. So thank you. And I'm super proud of each one of you for choosing to follow Jesus and to get up here today. And so, Brandon, you're, you're going to start the baptism. Um, we'll start with Charlie. Uh, we'll take a minute and just listen to Charlie and, and, and his words. I'm excited to get baptized today because I know that Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. I know that he died on the cross and rose again in three days. My name is Charlie Wood, and I have the hope of Jesus.
have Ruby. One Let's day we were talking about accepting Jesus as our Lord and Savior, and I realized I needed him to save me from my sins. So as I was walking around the living room, I prayed and accepted God as my Lord and Savior. I believe Jesus died on the cross to save me from my sins. My name is Ruby Wood, and I have the hope of Jesus.
Your 
Shout Jesus. Shout Jesus from the mountains. And Jesus in the streets. And Jesus in the darkness. Over every enemy. Jesus for my family. I speak the holy name. Jesus. Shout Jesus. over every enemy and Jesus for my family I speak the holy name Jesus shout Jesus from the mountains and Jesus in the streets and Jesus in the darkness over Church, just like every Sunday, we leave with our closing benediction, and Easter is no different. Let's read together from Matthew 9. When he saw the crowds, he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dejected like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is abundant, but the workers are few. Therefore, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. Guys, you are sent. Have a blessed Easter.